It is 9.37 a.m. Baby. All right, I'm just sitting here drawing, so we're just gonna go. I'm drawing Venom today. I don't know why. I did this sketch in my sketchbook this morning with my morning coffee, and it just came out looking like Venom. So I was like, when I moved it over to digital to do something on stream, I just went with the ve Venom scheme and actually put the icon on it. So let's chill, let's draw, let's be happy. Nice and early here in New York, not too hot, not too hot, not too cold. As we New Yorkers like to say, hot and cold. Been drawing since the wee hours, since 6 a.m. or something like that. Beautiful way to pass time, beautiful way to pass a life, really. I hope you're all feeling well. Hope you're all feeling energized, happy, present, vaguely whimsical. How do I get universal forces to talk to me and force me to draw? Oh man, you gotta invite him in. You just gotta invite him in, just don't resist. Let the forces in. I'm gonna draw, try to draw nice and slow and patiently today. Build things up a little bit by little bit. I'm not trying to knock out a full render or anything. I always say that and then just cause I'm talking to people and hanging out, I always wind up jumping ahead, shooting contrast everywhere. I'm gonna shoot my contrast. Am I feeling, I'm feeling better. I just remembered Thyrandor. Yeah, Thyrandor brings us all joy. I mean, he's a, a mystical font of happiness. You know, that's what he's uh, one of the dragon gods of. Sphinx god, Chimera god, however you interpret him. I mean, truly his form is just a representation of something beyond form. So he's really uh, too much to really explain. It's not to say that it's an inaccurate representation. It's almost like he's uh, that representation is simply a cross section of a higher dimensional being. Let me reposition my neck and my body. My neck and my body and my hair and my eyebrows and my mustache and my lips and my teeth. Let me twist this neck, this neck that has seen so much. Let me twist this neck the other way, this neck that has lost so much. Okay. Is drawing the best or what? I love drawing. Do I want to do a cooler Venom? They show him different ways. Sometimes he's truly black. Sometimes he's bluish. Sometimes he's purplish. That cooler scheme is kind of nice. Let's keep that in the back pocket. Nick Ravioli says, I'm giving Paradise Lost English another try and I'm actually making way better progress this time around, but it's still tough to read. It is, it is tough to read, but uh, it's great that you're giving it another shot. I mean, I think it's awesome. <laughs> I love it so much. I love it so much. When he describes all those fallen in the lake of fire. Ugh. Yeah, the opening is great. It's one of the, I mean, I'd recommend anybody at least just read that opening, like the first half of book one. It's like, even if you don't stick it out, um, the first half of book one is such a punch in the face. Like what? <laughs> I'd put it up against anything. I think it's my favorite thing. Hurled headlong flaming from the ethereal sky. He with his horrid crew lay vanquished, rolling in the fiery gulf, confounded though immortal. But from those flames, no light, but rather, Darkness visible, served only to illumine those duller shades. Nerdy's Bird says it's a school day, but I always watch anyway. See, Nerdy, you're so dedicated. I did this so stupid. I I don't know why I didn't save a layer for the um for the Venom logo. I guess I just wasn't sold on taking it all the way when I did this uh when I did the layer stack. It's completely impossible to work around. I think I'm just gonna paint over it. I think I'm just gonna paint through it and then I'll redo it over the rendering because um, it's gonna ruin everything for me to try to like paint up to the edges of the logo. So I'm just going to destroy it. Never be afraid to just destroy stuff all willy nilly. When you encounter moments like that in your pieces, don't get stuck hesitating or kind of mewling around and wishing you could think of some other way to fix it. It's like, you didn't spend that long on that thing anyway. It's like, I drew that logo in all of a minute. You just get married to it once it's down. It don't matter. Wouldn't you be better lasso and copy it? Nah, just like I said, it's like, just cause it's there doesn't mean it's worth saving, you know? 
And if I'm gonna put it over the rendering that I, like I'm removing it because I wanna render under it. So if I'm really gonna render it, then I'd rather redo the shape because then I can follow the bumps and contours of the rendering to make it feel like it's really wrapping around the forms. It's like, there's no need to save something that I did in all of a minute, you know? That's just gonna, if I'm gonna honor every little thing like that, it's, uh, you're gonna get stuck using a bunch of mediocre stuff in your pictures that would have been just better redone, you know? How do I stop myself from hating people who use AI and those who give them credit? Um, Try to remember how tall General Sherman in Sequoia National Park is. Let's see how tall he is. This is the best way to not be mad at people who use AI. General Sherman tree. General Sherman is a giant sequoia tree located in the giant forest of Sequoia National Park in Tular County in the United States state of California. By volume, it is the largest known living single stem tree on earth. It is estimated to be around 2,200 to 2,700 years old. While General Sherman is the largest currently living tree, it is not the largest historically recorded tree. The Lindsay Creek tree, with more than 90,000 cubic feet, that's 2,500 cubic meters, almost twice the volume of General Sherman, was reportedly felled by a storm in 1905. Another larger coast redwood, the Crannell, the Crannell Creek Giant, a coast redwood cut down in the mid-1940s near Trinidad, California, is estimated to have been 15 to 25% larger than the General Sherman tree by volume. How tall is General Sherman? 275 feet tall, 275 feet. You just think about that for a little bit. I think you'll have a hard time being angry at anybody. Just designing form. My favorite way to pass time. It is actually my favorite way to pass time. What a weird thing to be your favorite pastime, designing form. <laughs> Hello, Steven, just a quick question out of curiosity. Do you draw every day? Do you have an average number of hours you try to draw in a day? I do draw most days, yes. Um, in my old age, now that I have entered the decrepitude of antiquity, I do, um, I do take more days off now. Just, um, I'm more aware these days of when I'm drawing out of guilty compulsion as opposed to a loving, peaceful desire to be creative. So, and, and I was definitely burdened by that for a big portion of my life. You know, I was really caught up with, I'm sure many of you are familiar with just feeling like I had something to prove or I needed it to look like I was working hard so that people would take my desire to be an artist seriously. Um, and that made it, you know, very difficult to spend time with friends or to put anything on the calendar because my mind had entered this, I mean, let's be honest here, very maladaptive, neurotic, um, need to be like, I need to dump as much time into drawing as possible because that's the right thing to do or what I should be doing. Um, and that doesn't mean that was the state all the time, right? There, there, was, there was also times in there where things were aligned and I was doing it for the love of it. There's a reason I'm, I'm interested in doing that at all. But um, now in my, as I'm older, I see how deeply unhealthy and unnecessary that is. So um, now I have plenty of days where, thank God, um, like day, like on the weekends when I'm hanging out with my wife or family or things like that, I don't draw on those days. I just talk to human beings, listen to what's up in the world, relax. Um, and I'm much more mindful of how, because it's still there, right? I, I still, um, it'll still, pop up every now and then. I'll still get this dirty feeling while I'm out at dinner of like, aren't I an art teacher? People wanna learn art from me because I'm good. Shouldn't I be uh, dumping all of these hours in which I could be in communion with another conscious being into silently drawing over the table? Um, 
I used to take those thoughts very seriously uh, and now I laugh at them. <laughs> so I take much more days off now. My boy talks to people sometimes. Hi Steven, not to be a creepazoid, but I had a dream you were an art teacher at my school giving your usual good advice and critiques. I was imploring you to consider taking me as your apprentice. Whilst hearing me out, you were just smiling to yourself as though you were already aware we were in a dream and was waiting for me to make that realization. I remember that dream. That was a good one. I really liked the way that you rendered the uh, the school and your, your imploring to be my apprentice was a very nicely worded and honestly extremely... Um, compelling. It was a, a very good dream. Thank you for inviting me into that one. I had a lot of fun in that one. I keep resorting to trying to understand shapes of anatomy by copying rather than memorizing each part. Is memorizing anatomy necessary? Like the names. Um, it depends on your goals. I mean, I would argue that for most people, learning the names makes remembering the anatomy on a high level much easier. It seems like a chore, but the actual chore is trying to remember all of these discrete forms in great form detail without knowing their names. That That's actually the bigger chore. Um, I don't think learning the names is actually all that hard and it does make things easier. So for most people, I would advise just learning the names. It makes it, makes it much easier to grok the the situation when you're just starting out with it. If you don't plan on drawing a lot very realistically, um, I don't think it's that important. I don't personally. If you if you plan on doing tons of stylized work or if you plan on doing work that is mostly clothed, for example, like if you're going to do costumed characters and things like that and you know that's what you're going to go for rather than stuff like this, right? Everything about this drawing that I'm doing lets me know that I'm the kind of artist who should know a lot of anatomy. But if you plan on doing, you know, girls wearing dresses, I don't know, um, where it's all kind of flowing and stuff like that, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that you need to know a lot of anatomy for that. Like, you just don't. It all depends on your goals. I found a lot of great figure drawing artists on YouTube, you being one, thank you. Can't really find someone who does a lot of videos on clothes or just drawing clothes recommendations. The best clothing resource I have ever encountered is um, one that most people don't talk about, but uh, it was one of my favorite art books as a kid. It is Drawing the Clothed Figure by Barbara Bradley. For, um, for my money, that's one of the best art books ever written. Um, it's one of the rare ones that teaches draftsmanship and not just design, like straight objective information about materials or technique. There's very, very few books that teach draftsmanship. I think, um, it's like drawing, drawing lessons from the great masters by Robert Beverly Hale and drawing the clothed figure by Barbara Bradley. There's so few other books that teach draftsmanship. So you'll learn about clothes in that book, but you'll also learn a lot about just what to pay attention to while you draw. What do you mean they don't teach draftsmanship? What is this mysterious shit? It's hard to explain. It really is. Um, it's like draftsmanship as a category is like what ideas you should be paying attention to while drawing. Like, um, how to evaluate what's a good shape or a bad shape for the purpose that you're going for. Do you want to design the values to emphasize local value variations or do you want to design the values to emphasize the overall light and shadow effect? A lot of people, no one's even brought up like, oh, that's a choice to be made, right? And then much less is that even a choice. It's like, what criteria do you use to make an evaluation like that? And um, lots of people's styles are basically them just, you know, they've never even analyzed that there's those two options or things like that. Barbara Bradley explains all those things. She covers all those things in her book. What you mean by universal forces? What do you think I mean? Ghost alien demons. What else would I mean? Frickin' gray alien Beelzebubs. We're talking folksy American gray aliens with big eyes and fetoid heads, but with giant wings and they're biblically accurate, but also not biblically accurate. And um, they're 
jamming Bob Dylan out on electric space guitars, and uh, they're probing me. They're probing me, Doug. Did we transition from dreams to nightmares? We're always oscillating between the two. I'm having trouble understanding what is the job of a storyboard artist? Are they in charge with the framing, composition, and pacing of a scene? Isn't that a director's job, however? It is the director's job, but the storyboard artist shows that to them. Like, the director is the one who decides this scene is going to be extremely fast-paced and it's going to have a lot of close cuts to inserts of actions and things like that. The storyboard artist shows them that finds a way to produce that feeling with the visuals. Um, the director looks at it or you make an animatic out of it. The director is like, oh, that does feel like what I was hoping for. Sign off. Or feels, no, that's not quite right. Feedback, feedback, feedback. There you go. Look at this sexy expert fan art, says Joe. Yeah, Joe knows. This is my, my one piece of fan art for the year. My one piece of fan art for the year always winds up being... Um, Venom, Carnage, or Hulk. That's always what it is, because those are, <laughs> those designs just, my drawings accidentally become those, because those designs are built on anatomy and mass and transformation and extremeness. Why is Marvel not hiring you to do covers? Well, I think that's, um, that's fine as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it's okay. And to be clear, the reason they're not hiring me is because I don't have a comics cover portfolio. You need the portfolio to get jobs like that. You've got to put it out there. It's not art director's jobs to extrapolate from your other kinds of pictures to what you could do. You need to package it for them, brand it for them, and show them that you can do exactly what they're looking for. So just to, uh, I know Joe's joking. I just wanted to edify the beginners out there. It's like, you're not gonna get jobs doing the stuff you want just by kind of doing vaguely related stuff. It's like, you just need to show the thing. That's the only way to get the jobs. Let's see how we can put our spider guy back on. Just slugging it in so I can see what layer mode is going to work. Color dodge actually works decently, surprisingly. Modern day games. The inimitable modern day Hyams. The infatigable modern day Hyams. Here to be annoying, says James. We're happy to be annoyed. We're always happy to be annoyed by you, James. Currently exhausted. Oh, my dear James, I'm sending you psychic energy. I hope you're feeling it. I'm sending you powerful psychic energy. Esoteric energies from the depth of the consciousness void. Let's keep it more graphic like that for my venom. And let's see how much we want to. So what I usually do for a value decision like this is um, I'll squint my eyes and I'll bring the value change in. And I'll stop right where it's very clear to me, even with my eyes squinted. That way I leave some room to do further work into it instead of going full contrast. Seeing if I can see it when I look at the thumbnail. So at about 60% opacity is where it's clear to me when I squint my eyes. So I'm gonna leave it there for now. And then I know I'm gonna add color dodgy highlights on this. So let me just slug those in too so I can make sure that the value ranges are all playing nice, all playing nicely. How do you learn concept art if it is really unaffordable for me? I've used so many resources on YouTube, but I feel it's just not enough. Currently, I really don't know um, I can get my work critiqued. Um, if you really can't afford it, just focus on designing. I know this might be hard to believe, but take it from me. This is really true. Just focus on designing stuff you like. Um, it's, you can't learn concept art. It's not a, a lot of people want to bill it like it's um, a 
thing, like a monolithic thing that it's like, it's this skill set and every game and movie and stuff like that needs that skill set. And it just isn't true. It really isn't true. Um, if you can't afford all this stuff, that's like, I'll teach you how to be a concept artist. Don't worry about it. You can come back to it later. Just focus on being a good designer. The important thing is to be a good designer. And the most important part of being a good designer is to iterate over and over again on designing things. So pick movies, TV shows, books, or stories that you love, that you're a really big fan of from your life, and just redesign them. Change the genre, change the time period, change the cultural influence, and let your familiarity with the product guide you to interesting and thoughtful questions about it. And that's always going to be the most important practice for a designer. That's always going to be more important than, you know, how to integrate photos without it looking like shit, you know, whatever concept art tip anyone has. It's like, you can come back to those things later and there's surely useful tips there, but no one, if that's all you knew, if you were excellent at literally all of that stuff, you knew Photoshop right up the asshole, you understood everything about value configurations and stuff like that, color theory, you still wouldn't, that doesn't mean you're a good designer. That still doesn't mean anyone would wanna hire you for a concept art job. You need to connect with the content. You need to connect with the content. So I'm not saying that stuff doesn't matter at all, right? You will likely need to go learn some of that stuff, but if you can't afford it for now, the most important thing that you do need to learn is freely available. You just need to practice it. Hey Zapata, would it be okay if I model one of your concepts? Of course. I don't know that that value range is what I want for this. Let me do it right in the, right in the goop, right in the soup. Need it to blend in more nicely with the actual pixels underneath. Talking in a Steven Zapata stream while I should be working on a commission. Woohoo. Oh, oh no. Anirud. Anirud. You bad boy. How could you do that? How could you do that? All right, what exactly do I want to do here? What exactly do I want to do here? I want to start getting the sinewy venom thing going on, having things bleed into each other, cross over each other do unreal things that don't happen on the actual anatomy. Do you think pain is important for art? What if art could be a way to transform pain into utter joy? Um, it can do that, I believe, but I don't think pain is important for art. It can be important to a person. Your particular traumas and things like that can really, they can make you think deeply about things and they can certainly influence you as a person. And if you're lucky, you can have relationships with your trauma that you experience as growth, as you making meaning out of them. And um, you can come to find that stuff very valuable. But for every person who can make meaning out of their trauma and come to sort of feel fortunate for the growth they had, there's another person whose trauma really doesn't allow that and who has no interest in making meaning out of it. It is simply senseless suffering. Um, and for them, I don't, I don't think there's any need for them to bring their pain into their art if uh, they're uninterested in that. So um, yeah, I don't think pain is deeply important to art on some existential level. I think uh, art runs just fine being a process of joy and happiness. But if it is important to you as an individual, it makes sense to bring it into your art and art will certainly transform it and do interesting things to it. But I think what, what artists need most in the current era is less, um, less pain. They need to learn how to mine the joy from art that is there. I think that things are a little bit out of balance these days. I think uh, it's very easy to have a extremely painful relationship with art in the current era 
and it's rarer to do it happily and peacefully. So I think that our focus these days needs to be on finding ways to do that. Let's see if we want the rim lighting. I saw someone mentioned earlier in the chat that they dreamed of rim lighting on this piece. Let's see. When I do rim lighting, I want to use it because it's useful. You know, I, I need it to pop off forms over near the contour that are sort of failing at the moment. But um, I just don't think I need it here. Yeah, it's just not, not right now. It's not bringing, it's not bringing attention to important parts of the design. It's always in the tool bag though. That doesn't mean it won't come back. Uh, Steven or anyone in the chat, do you have any horse or animal anatomy books you would recommend to study? Um, I would check out the Joe Weatherly Guide to Drawing Animals. That, um, that's not strictly an animal anatomy book but it teaches the more important stuff. It teaches the draftsmanship principles that apply to drawing animals. And I think that's way more bang for your buck for someone who wants to get into an animal, animal drawing at first. Hey, Steven, what are your thoughts on traditional to digital workflows in a professional environment? Um, I don't think there are any problem in a professional environment. I mean, the you just need to keep the traditional part pretty light in a, in a professional environment just because of time constraints. But I don't think there's, in most professional environments, no one's going to care if you like do your initial sketches um, on paper and then scan them or take a photo and then work them up. Like what I did here. Like I did that sketch with my morning coffee and then I threw it in Photoshop and I'm elaborating on it digitally. No one's going to care if you do that. I mean, that's totally, totally fine. Totally workable. Um, to spend a really long time doing traditional that's going to be a problem in most settings. But if it's just a little bit of time spent traditional, no problem. Use it for what it's good for, the initial energy and connection and things like that, and then switch it over. Feels like I can reach out and touch Venom. Looks good. Reach out and touch Venom. Your own personal Venom. Reach out and touch Venom. And bring it back road trip memories. Ah, the oldies. Song's a jam though. Look, just reach out and touch Venom. Reach out and touch Venom. But call me anytime you can call me, baby, day or night, call me. Stephen, what are your most useful tips for drawing faces? I struggle with that part the most, but the body seems easier. Um, if I had to boil it down in one thing, it'd be stop looking at the features. The number one thing that, for my kind of drawing, the number one thing that holds people back on faces and heads is that they can't stop focusing on the high contrast, honestly incidental facts of the eyes, the nose, the lips. And the way, that's not a bad thing if you understand them in context, but the the way beginners tend to look at those features is that they, they can't help it. They just see them as graphic shapes. They just see eyebrows as particular shapes, eyelashes as particular shapes, the value and color change that make the lips into flat graphic shapes. Um, you've got to realize how distracting that is to the real facts of the face, which is it's raw mass. Um, I think that a lot of people would benefit greatly by spending some time drawing, obsessing about the masses of flesh between the facial features rather than the facial features themselves. And there's a lot of things we could then extrapolate from that, like looking at it as basic geometric shapes, looking at its overall planar uh, aspects, but um, those are all much deeper holes. But if I had to boil it down to one thing, it's that it's like, stop, looking at the features, at the attention grabbing features, and look at the totality of the head and all of the fleshy mass between the features.
Brian Medina says, damn, dude, how do you have the patience and skill to draw that? <laughs> you fool. I was born that way. You may think you can catch up, but that'd be completely impossible. It's my destiny to be this good. I don't know what to tell you. For some of us, it just comes easy. How long you been drawing? Oh. As long as the stars have been in the sky. As long as the waves have lapped at the sandy ocean shore. As long as the leaves have tumbled from their faded places season after season after season. For as long as one beast has consumed another. For as long as the wind has blown to and fro, from heat to cold, as long as there has been pain, and as long as there has been love. About 16 years, about 16 years. Actually, it's my whole life. I always say 16 years because that's when I remember becoming improvement focused, but I've been drawing my whole life since I was a little kid, since I was like five. How do you draw the Maximus Maximus? I've been trying to understand its intersection and origin, but it always evades me. All right, real quick, real quick tutorial. All right, so the problem that most people have with the Maximus Maximus is that they forget about the general shape. So it's like, if you're really focused on the Maximus Maximus, it has to read on the silhouette, like its overall shape has to be correct. So it's like, you got the human head up here, say it's something like that, neck comes down, so we got one shoulder over there and then the Maximus Maximus edits the silhouette so that it's like, yeah, you know? And then it comes down here into the small of the back and then you get the Maximus Minimus, which is more commonly known as the gluteal butts. And then you just gotta fit all of the other muscles into here. So this is the trapezoid, which interacts this way with the Maximus Maximus. This is the infrasplendugu. So the terrasus majoris, this is the rhombidius. You gotta mirror them symmetrically. On the other side, of course, the ladicinus dicni wraps around that way, sort of plunges to the forward side of the armpit. The erection pine down here at the bottom. Sacral triangle. Gluteals. Wasp Wasticus, and then the Chickenus Legacus. It's that simple. I like the way this guy came out. This middle member here. I don't know, I like the overall look of that. That's got something cool going on. Ooh, getting real hungry. Just wanna do a little bit more. I'd like to figure out how I want to handle this hand before I get going. I love drawing hands. At least in this context where it's just like transforming them, being free with them. They're so much fun. All right, yeah, that'll work. That will work. We had fun drawing today. We did a Venom. We did a Venom, reach out and touch Venom. Look, just reach out and touch Venom. We don't wanna just see Venom, man. We wanna touch Venom, man. You police, you, you government officials, you're up there in your ivory tower. You're saying we can't touch Venom. We wanna touch Venom, man. We're not just content to just see Venom. You guys are gatekeeping Venom. We wanna touch Venom, man. Please come get more art advice in my dreams again. No problem. You got it. I can promise you. Yep. Yep. And how do you make strong shapes work with anatomy and making it work without it looking super unrealistic? You have to ask yourself what part of the shape you want to push and let the other part of it kind of carry the realism for you if you want it to not look unrealistic. So. Um, what I usually do is I push the two-dimensional shape 
of any given anatomical element, but I let the rendering that I do make it look realistic. So the lighting, the modeling, um, triggers in the viewer's eye that this is a real looking thing, even if the individual 2D shapes that make it up are totally wild and totally out there. Um, so it, the 2D shapes are just as crazy as possible and then let the rendering handle the realism. Is the Dream Visiting a new program you're offering? Yeah, we're soft launching it, we're test running it. It's in the beta, uh, early access, invite only. Um, the Dream Visitation Mentorship Program, yeah. Well, you know, as, as things get more developed, we'll release more info, suit it up. Daryl Grant says, speaking of dreams, I forgot to say that I had a dream where you released the full video of the subliminal dancing Steven that appears during the countdown, and I could not stop laughing when I woke up. Now that's weird. I'm glad that cracked you up. Don't you love a dream that makes you laugh so hard it wakes you up? I love those, those are so weird. I love waking up laughing. A bit of encouragement to keep drawing and not give up because of AI, please. Yeah, don't give up because of AI. It's not time to give up. It is time for action, for vigor, and for belief. Do not give up because of the AI. Don't forget that no one, we don't know how the AI thing is gonna shake out. And um, I personally feel a lot of optimism. I know that may sound like a surprise coming from me, but um, as my research continues, as I continue to gain more knowledge, as I continue to talk to more people, um, I've only been more been made more optimistic by, um, how to put this, more optimistic about the depth of their fuck up and the, re the, real, the realism or the practicality of holding them accountable and creating some sort of recourse, nudging things in a better direction, creating some sort of legislation. Um, we'll go all into all of that stuff later, more, in more detail later, but um, yeah, I personally don't, I don't think you should be despairing right now. Um, yeah, I've only been made more optimistic by uh, what I've learned. We don't know how this thing's gonna shake out. Thanks for the stream, super educative, especially Baximus Maximus. I'm, you know, that's the real secrets of drawing right there, the Baximus Maximus. I mean, that's how you draw, baby. Now that's how you draw. Now that, now that's how you draw. Now that right there, baby, that right there is how you draw. Baby, baby, that's how you draw, baby. Now baby, 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 that's how you draw. Baby, oh baby. Baby, oh baby, baby, oh baby. That's how you draw, baby. Ooh, that's how you draw. Ooh, look at that intense silhouette. Ooh, baby, baby, baby. The gluteus buttocus, baby, the maximus, maximus. I can't stop looking at the trapezoids. Oh, the curve. The curve of the Latinitz, the power of the Tereides Majoris. Now that's how you draw, baby. Baby, that's how you draw, baby. Oh yeah, baby. All right, everybody. I'll see you soon.